Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who has joined. Thank you for joining the session on preparing the next generation of youth leaders to accelerate climate ad adaptation in cities. We appreciate your time. We look forward to this exciting session. We are happy to be here at the 14th International Conference for Community-Based Adaptation. And uh, we are happy to provide uh, some context to the way we have organized the session today and uh, how we'll be seeking uh, your feedback on this very important uh, and dear topic to us. Uh, just a few housekeeping rules as we uh, start the session. Uh, we will be starting with a panel discussion. During this panel discussion, your microphones and videos of the participants will be off. Uh, and this is a 30 minute session. Uh, you will see on the control bar uh, in the Zoom, uh, the microphone mute sign, as you see here, the symbol will be muted. Uh, once we begin the breakout sessions, which is the second half of the session uh, today, your, you will be able to unmute yourselves and speak and participate in the conversation. In addition to that, one key thing for you all to remember uh, is in the breakout sessions that you can click on the participant icon here in the middle and you can raise your hand if you would like to provide comments on the key questions that are for discussion during the breakout session. In addition to that, uh, you can also type in your questions in the chat and we will be reviewing all the questions that come up in the chat and uh, selecting and going through as many questions as we can for discussions or comments for discussion as well. In addition, you will notice there's a share screen for so for today's uh, session, of course, uh, the participants can't share screen. Uh, the presenters would be sharing their screens for both uh, the breakout session as well as the panel discussion. Uh, your, uh, just for you to note, the session will be recorded by the organizers and parts of the session will be available in recorded form if you would like to uh, listen into the session later as well. And these will be made available by IID on their website. During the session, if there are reactions uh, that you have to what the speakers are saying, there's also an interesting reaction uh, icon that you see at the bottom, reaction function that is available where you can share your likes or dislikes to what is being discussed. Uh, this will be a great way for you to interact while the session is in progress. So this was just some quick house rules. Uh, now we will go on to uh, a, a discussion. I think we have covered this. Uh, if you do have any technical difficulties uh, while the session is in progress, where, where your chat function or your unmute function is not working, please uh, let us know. You can interact uh, with us through either the participant function or through chat or raise your hand and we will try to resolve uh, your technical difficulties. We have uh, Vittorio and Egle, uh, two people from uh, the organizers team who are here to help support that. And now we would like to, as we have more participants join in, we would like to uh, engage in a small ice icebreaker session where we would request you to go uh, on your phones or on your laptops, however you are dialed in, please go to www.menti.com and we have two quick questions that we want your reactions to. Once you go to this mentimeter.com site, the, please use this uh, code that you see on the screen to uh, enter, into the, enter your responses to the two questions we have. I'll stop sharing my screen now and we'll all go to the Mentimeter link.
And the first question is, as you see, what word do you think of when you hear youth leadership? And just to remind everyone, you can still see the code at the top of the screen. The code again is <laughs> That's great. Thank you for all your comments there. Uh, our second Mentimeter question, just to get to know you better, could you please let us know which organizations do you represent? Government, NGO, academic institutions, this would be a great way for us to know who are the participants today for this session. Great, we have a lot of presence from academic institutions, NGOs, as well as some government uh, representatives and civil society organizations. That's great. Well, thank you for sharing this with us. We appreciate it. It gives us all a good sense of who all are here today. So this is just a word cloud showing you what we all thought and typed in when we uh, thought of youth leadership. Uh, a lot of uh, innovation, empowerment, knowledge co-production, dynamism, and also an experience highlighted and energy. Um, great. Five academic institutes, three NGOs, two government representatives, one donor organization, one civil society organizations, and one Policy think tank, that's great. Thank you. I think uh, we'll go back to our main session now. Thank you all, really appreciate you sharing uh, this information with us. Uh, now, going on to our main session, just wanted to quickly uh, in introduce you to the run of the show. Uh, we will, as I mentioned earlier, we will uh, have an introductory session introducing you to the panelists for today. Uh, this will be led by our moderator today, Dr. Murli Chandrasekharan. Uh, he will lead the introductions and then start the panel discussion. We will first begin with opening remarks from uh, the Canadian ambassador, Patricia Fuller, uh, who is here today with us, and we thank her for her, for her presence and her participation. Her opening remarks will be followed by remarks by our uh, panelists. Each panelist will have three minutes to provide their remarks on this topic area, we, which will be followed by a discussion that will be moderated uh, by Dr. Morley with the panelists. Uh, once we close the panel discussion, we will enter into the breakout uh, group discussions. And here we will be discussing 
two questions for each group. We will break out into four groups and each group will have 25 minutes and each of you will have time to share your comments and thoughts on the questions that we want to discuss and get your inputs on. We will then reconvene uh, the breakout groups to report back on what we heard from each session. So that's the overall structure of the session. I will now hand it over to Dr. Murley just to introduce him. He is the professor of behavioral science at the Souther School of Business at University of British Columbia. He teaches classes on global issues, macroeconomics and urban resilience. He is also the vice provost international at UBC working on convening collaborations to together focus attention on issues of global relevance. Uh, his ambition and goals are to shepherd and he continues to build larger alliances to do this, to shepherd future leaders in their global citizenship journey. And some interesting other facts about Dr. Murley is that he has started uh, professional curling <laughs> in Vancouver and cooks uh, is a great avid cook and cooks for his wife and three daughters every day. Thank you to Dr. Murley for uh, agreeing to moderate the session. Over to you. Thank you, Smitha. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I think in the last uh, nine years, Living in Vancouver, I have become more Canadian than most Canadians because I have started <laughs> curling comparatively. So let me kick the session off. It's, it's, you know, it's a great time to have the session because, I, you know, we live in a time of astounding inequalities uh, from poverty, lack of access to education, the disproportionate impact of climate change on the vulnerable to racial injustice, gender equality, and just from basic incivility to disrespect for those who don't look, talk, and think like us, the challenges we face together are innumerable. In turn, COVID-19 has vividly laid bare the undeniable fact that shocks and stresses uh, affect the world's most vulnerable who live in informal settlements and slums without access to running water or adequate housing. And even as we continue to be engulfed by the COVID-19 crisis, that has essentially driven societies to greater isolation, uh, we're recognizing the shaky foundations on which global prosperity gains of the recent past rest. Uh, and indeed, despite progress in many areas, deep-rooted and increasingly widening social, environmental, and economic divides and disparities characterize our world today. But there's optimism though, that as we cautiously emerge from the long shadow of this crisis, voices are emerging that urge for greater collaboration, inclusion, and multilateralism so we can together bridge divides and mutually benefit from the thinking and talent of a range of partners with whom our collective and individual futures are inexorably and inextricably linked. And it is to this chorus really of inspiring voices that universities need to and can add their voice. We need now more than ever before to embrace the view that universities are indeed global actors, and we need to work collaboratively with a range of partners from a range of sectors and geographies, much like the ones that are represented in today's uh, discussion. So there are two issues that are central to this. Uh, the first is to shepherd youth leaders to greater global citizenship. Uh, and indeed, these are the leaders who should have the opportunity to learn about global challenges such as climate adaptation, and this passion, as you saw in the Mentimeter, this passion, future, the power, the energy, the uh, perspective of innovation that we believe youth have, but also a sense of inexperience where we, the rest of this ecosystem, need to provide opportunities that propel youth leaders in this challenge. The second issue is to develop knowledge in collaboration with communities and think about youth-inspired research. All of this takes time, and so we need to think about the long haul game that has both urgency built into it, but also patience in order to drive action. And one of the things that we'll talk about is this collaborative for urban re resilience and effectiveness that I am part of, that has worked in cities, worked on projects with students from cross disciplinary teams, cross institutional and cross continental teams to really add value. So that's the background for today's discussion. 
And we're really excited that we have uh, Ambassador uh, Patricia Fuller uh, to kick us off in this conversation. And we have a terrific panel, uh, Lauren Sorkin, Sheila Patel, Rohir Van Vandenberg, and Dr. Rosalind West. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide, uh, it's my pleasure really to introduce to you uh, Ambassador Fuller, uh, who is Canada's Ambassador for Climate Change, named in 2018 for a term of three years. And in her role, she provides advice on climate change considerations in Canada's international priorities. And as you can see, leads bilateral engagements with partner countries on clean growth and climate change. And she represents Canada in the Global Commission on Adaptation. Uh, Patricia, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Morali. It's really a pleasure to be here at, at CBA 14. And I'd like to congratulate the, the World Resources Institute and the Collaborative for Urban Resilience and Effectiveness for organizing this event and, and in particular for the focus uh, on preparing uh, the, the leaders of the, the future. I think with what we are seeing now with the, the, the climate crisis and the global pandemic uh, layering uh, one on top of the other, uh, we're seeing the, the resilience of populations uh, around the world uh, being severely tested. And I think we see, uh, for example, on the west coast of, of North America, well, where you are, Dr. Morali, uh, that uh, you know, we have situations like uh, the need to create centers for people to go to have uh, uh, well-ventilated air to breathe. And yet, at the same time, we're in a pandemic. So being together in a center is, is not... Uh, a good strategy. So we see the com compounding of, of these crises and uh, the test that that represents for resilience. And so certainly preparing the leaders of tomorrow, uh, well, it's, as you say, it's a long haul game. Uh, it's, it's, it's so important and the, uh, it will test all of the innovation and, and dynamism of our, of our youth that was highlighted so much in the, uh, uh, in the poll that we took at the beginning of this session. Uh, so I, I would just like to, to talk about uh, uh, the work of the Global Commission on Adaptation, uh, which I, I hope uh, can be helpful to the discussion uh, about preparing uh, the leaders of the, the future. Uh, the goal of the uh, Global Commission on Adaptation uh, was to uh, to, to bring a, a greater urgency, scale, and innovation to the efforts around adaptation uh, to, do, to address the impacts of climate change that, that are already upon us. Uh, it was launched, launched by the, the Dutch government in 2018, and uh, it's a two-year effort that will we'll wrap up in uh, January uh, at uh, the Climate Adaptation Summit on January 25th. Uh, so with respect to uh, the challenge, the, the commission uh, in, its, in its flagship report that was released last year said that really what we need is a, a revolution in thinking on three levels. One is in understanding the risk that, that faces us, pricing it, uh, assessing it much more effectively, and that is a skill that needs to be, needs to be built up. Uh, second, in, in planning such that, that climate risk is mainstreamed across decisions in the public and private sphere. Uh, and third, uh, around financing uh, to mobilize uh, not just public financing, but also private financing for adaptation. Uh, on this basis, eight action tracks were established by the Commission uh, to scale up adaptation solutions and, and drive that innovative thinking. Uh, these action tracks include uh, the one that Canada and Mexico are leading, which is on nature-based solutions, as well as the city, Cities Action Track, which uh, WRI and, and SMITA uh, are leading, uh, and also the locally-led action track, which uh, Sheila, who we'll hear from later, is, is leading. Uh, so with respect to the, the, uh, the action track for nature-based solutions, uh, certainly uh, nature-based solutions uh, are uh, an enormous uh, resource for building resilience. 
Uh, and uh, I've been fortunate to be part of a couple of discussions already today around the power of, of nature-based uh, solutions. They are certainly getting more attention, although those of you who've been working for a long time in the conservation fields or certainly uh, uh, representatives of indigenous communities have known this for a long time, but the attention that nature-based solutions gets uh, around uh, policy-making tables or corporate tables is not uh, what it needs to be and certainly doesn't reflect the the uh, uh, the power of these types of solutions to reduce uh, the impacts of climate change, uh, whether it's in uh, the cooling effects of urban forests or the protection of coastlines uh, with mangroves or attenuation of flooding with restoration of wetlands. Uh, so there is certainly a powerful case to uh, make for working with nature to reduce climate risks. Uh, and in collaboration with the, uh, the city's action track, we plan to profile uh, cities which are leaders in this area. So for example, uh, in Brazil, the municipality of Campinas is protecting and, and restoring forested watersheds uh, that are helping uh, to improve the urban water supply for, for 3 million city residents, as well as to reduce floods. And in, uh, in Vancouver, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the rain city strategy has been adopted that aims to capture and clean 90% of the city's rainwater by incorporating nature-based solutions into land use planning uh, and urban design. So uh, um, these, are, these are powerful examples. Uh, we also on this action track are partnering with uh, a youth-led organization to profile the leadership of youth in, in promoting and implementing nature-based solutions. So certainly we are thinking about uh, the leaders of the future. And um, I will conclude there just by saying that uh, to meet this challenge of adaptation to climate change, certainly uh, innovative thinking is required and ambitious action is required. So preparing the leaders of tomorrow is certainly an essential part. Uh, to take on this uh, this challenge. So again, congrat congratulations to the organizers for this session, and I will stay for it as much for as much of it as as I as I can. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Fuller. Uh, so let's uh, let's turn uh, to our panel uh, and uh, have a discussion kicking off with uh, with Lauren Sarkin, who's the executive director of the Global Resilient Cities Network and she's based in Singapore, uh, where she oversees global efforts to strengthen cities in the face of complex and interconnected challenges, the layering idea that Ambassador Fuller, Fuller talked about. And uh, Lauren leads a team uh, that's distributed around the globe, as you can see, and working with chief resilience officers of cities in 40 countries. And she builds on this work uh, on the legacy of the 100 Resilient Cities Program, uh, that is so central now to the building of resilience of communities and critical infrastructure. And I have known Lauren for many years now, and she was an early uh, co-conspirator in the Urban Resilience Pedagogical Program that has now become the Collaborative for Urban Resilience and Effectiveness. Uh, so Lauren, my friend, over to you. Thanks, Marley, and it's such a pleasure to be here. This is an issue that, as you said, we've been collaborating on for some time and that I'm tremendously passionate about. Um, just a few words about the Resilient Cities Network. Um, we are a network of practitioners and, and of doers. And so I'm gonna speak briefly about what we do and then I'm really looking forward to interacting with the other panelists and also with all of you um, about where we go from here. So the Global Resilient Cities Network, for those of you who aren't familiar, is the world's leading resilience practitioners network. And so we bring together city practitioners, partnerships and funding, and we empower our cities. We work together as a blended team and our mission is to reduce vulnerabilities and improve the well-being of 220 million urban dwellers in 97 cities around the world. We do this by three main uh, delivery areas. The first is around that empowerment. 
So we, we can't uh, respond to the challenges that the ambassador spoke so eloquently about without building capacity in place. Um, and that's another reason I'm so excited about this partnership because universities are absolutely critical to that. We see ourselves as a knowledge base. And so what we do is we collect uh, common shared best practice and we create communities of practice around that with our cities and we deepen that and then go on and implement. So we work with our cities to take care and set up multi-city programs to deliver on the ground. Um, and I think many um, who worked in the space for a long time often say cities are a challenging space to work because once you go down to that subnational level, it's tricky to get projects done. Well, working between cities and groups and having that mutual accountability is something that we've found to be tremendously helpful to try to move these important issue areas forward um, at scale and at the pace really that the world needs. And, and finally, we work to mobilize investment for our cities themselves. And so if we want to get serious around uh, getting projects that are going to deliver multiple benefits, we have to design them and we have to incentivize them. So we also spend a lot of time um, focusing on getting projects that are going to build the resilience in cities funded. We work on three opportunity areas. Um, that we see as the priority for building city resilience right now. They are interlinked because all of our challenges in cities as systems are interlinked. And so I'll just speak to them very briefly here. We work on holistic resilience as a lens for looking at systems and around shocks and stresses. And then within that holistic approach, we deal with these three cross-cutting themes, COVID recovery, with a specific attention to equity and the economic opportunity that Merle, you spoke to in your opening. Um, we also look at climate resilience. Clearly that's uh, our topic of the day. Um, and within that, drilling deeper to really focus on issues that communities grapple with. In particular, water and energy, but energy in terms of how it empowers community distributed energy and renewable energy. And finally, circular economy, waste management and food systems. Um, and I just wanna close by saying uh, we are dedicated to this mission, creating a safe and equitable world um, and very, very much looking forward to empowering youth leaders as a part of that agenda going forward. Thank you, Lauren. Fantastic. Uh, so uh, let's uh, let's turn to our, uh, our next uh, our panelist, Sheila Patel. Uh, Sheila is a founding director of Spark, an NGO that's been working for decades now to support community organizations uh, of the urban poor in their efforts to secure housing and basic amenities. And she is a legend, uh, and uh, you know she continues to inspire as she seeks attention to the issues of urban poverty, the various themes that uh, are, are part of our discussion today. She's also a co-founder of Slum Dwellers International, which is a transnational social movement in urban poor and currently its chairperson as well. Uh, Sheila, over to you. Thank you, Murali, for all those generous words. Uh, I'm delighted to be part of this, uh, this session because for the last 35 years, I have worked very hard to not only work with organizations of the urban poor, it started working in India and who are my organization's partners, but we also have a network and a social movement of slum dwellers who are federated in 33 countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, working in around 350 to 400 cities. And for all the rhetoric that we hear in events like this, there is a deep structural ravine that separates informality and the formal city. And so one of the things I want to do as part of this session is to get a commitment from Lauren that we are going to work together after this. 
because there are so many reasons why cities have good justification for not providing basic amenities and services to the urban poor. And COVID has shown the implications of that. My role as a commissioner in the GCA has been uh, both timely and extremely educational because it has shown us that every single challenge that the urban poor face has a deep foundational climate lens. And that while poor people have shown amazing capacity to produce a adaptive resilience, which is in the realm of survival, the inability of the nation states, the global institutions, and our local cities to work with communities at scale to produce these minimum equities of citizenship have been laid bare in this COVID period. So the way in which we seek to solve this challenge is to say that the three most important characteristics, or characters, sorry, that we need to, to produce into a long-term engagement at the local level is the city authorities, the Slum Dwellers Association, and the local university. And the reason why that is important is that all three produce elements of knowledge that can produce all the sustainable development goals that are linked to cities, can address all the wicked problems of climate change that need to be addressed. And that as a champion personally, along with Dr. Musa, who is also a commissioner from BRAC, we have made a 10-year commitment to engage these three local actors into a long-term relationship that they bring their knowledge together along with whatever gets contributed from national and global levels to produce the transformation that is going to take us five to 10 years to do because it took us two centuries to produce the intergenerational poverty that poor people live in. And therefore we need long-term solutions. This particular discussion is about young people. Uh, it's very important in this conversation to not only talk about young people studying in universities, but also to think about the youth young men and women in informal settlements who are today a very serious majority in the informal settlements because both in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, which are the two most rapidly urbanizing areas on the globe, they are a huge demographic advantage, disadvantage, depending on how much we invest in their transformation. And unfortunately, their presence as representatives of poor communities and youth is hardly there in these international events, let alone national and local events. So the exploration that I'm looking for is to look at the local and global networks that bring in knowledge, resources and partnerships. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Uh, let's turn to Rohia, uh, who is the Urban Development Director at the uh, World Resources Institute, the Ross Center for Sustainable Cities. And, you know, he leads uh, global programming on all matters related to cities, uh, land use, climate change, adaptation, and so on. And, uh, he also holds multiple hats, urban planning, development, architect, he's a former entrepreneur, and has led the UN Habitats Urban uh, Lab uh, just a few years ago. So Rohir, over to you, my friend. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks uh, to be part of this uh, panel. And um, i really like to build upon uh, the former two speakers and also the great framing that Sheila provided on that uh, city-community-university collaboration. I think two things that really are standing out already in the discussion right now is the 
it's the long-term engagement and scale. So how, how are you going to, to do that? And I am uh, together with Smita uh, leading the Cities Action Track under the Global Commission of Adaptation uh, that Ambassador Fuller referred to in her opening uh, remarks. Um, so how, how, do you, how do you bring these together um, in this kind of impactful, um, 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 uh, for, for creating impactful solutions uh, on the ground? Um, so doing that, we, have, uh, we are looking at uh, launching um, a knowledge platform for inclusive climate adaptation um, at the Adaptation Summit uh, the 25th of January in, uh, in Rotterdam under the Global Commission of uh, Adaptation, bringing universities, uh, cities, and the Federation of Urban Poor Communities uh, together in really looking at a scaled program, um, research programs, um, and actual partnerships on the ground to, uh, to, to develop that kind of that long-term research action community city alliance. Um, and it's quite, quite complex to, to, to establish. Everybody here at the table knows, I've, for a long time I was kind of um, head of the urban department in Amsterdam and I brought students from Amsterdam to Sao Paulo. And they were actually surprised that the students from Sao Paulo never went to the informal settlements that we were actually, uh, that we were actually working with. So I think re-establishing that connection is kind of highly, highly, highly relevant. And if you, if you do that, you can from there build centers of actual excellence and try to establish also kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning between cities and communities. Um, I kind of refer to briefly to the cities action track um, under which this kind of initiative is being developed together with, with Cure, with SDI, with GRCN, the Global Center for Adaptation, among others. Um, and we, um, in the run up to the Adaptation Summit uh, in January, we launched already the program to train that next generation of, uh, uh, of leaders. Um, with 10 projects, and Dr. Morley, you are very well uh, aware of uh, these 10 projects that we um, uh, have launched um, um, together with universities in Kenya, in the US, in Mexico, Indonesia, and Bangladesh, already to kind of make this kind of connection, this tripartite collaboration between university, city, and community actionable on the ground. That's for the summer semester, uh, sorry, for the, uh, uh, for the fall semester uh, 2020. So maybe a last couple of things that I, that I want to say that um, on, in the context of the city action track where we bring together uh, city networks, uh, institutions and knowledge partners together, we really look at scaling up um, the efforts around climate resilience in, in cities. And we can do that because we work together in a lot of kind of similar geographies and we can make use of our complementary um, entry points to uh, both uh, the national authorities, the local authorities, but also to the real kind of knowledge um, um, uh, uh, partners in cities. And maybe the last thing that I, that I want to say about this kind of opportunity of creating these, uh, this, this next generation of leaders and that long-term engagement between city community and, um, um, and university is that um, localized data and really kind of localized research is, is, is essential and only based on that you can come to really kind of solutions that, uh, that make sense, that are community driven and community owned. Um, thank you very much. And sorry for the background noise. I don't know if you, if you hear my, my thank kids. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you were just great. Thank you, Rohit. Uh, and uh, last but certainly not the least, Dr. Rosalind West, who's joining us from uh, the UK, uh, where she's the climate resilience team lead, as you see, uh, for the foreign, UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, and works specifically in uh, the Africa program uh, with the idea to understand, improve the understanding of African climate science and how to bring that into decision-making. She's a passionate uh, person about action-oriented use inspired research and she certainly uh, shares that with me as a kindred spirit uh, and is called developing the Adaptation Research Alliance uh, with a view to adding value at COP26. Uh, Rosalind, over to you. 
Thanks so much. And thanks very much to everyone for the opportunity to speak with you today. It's a real privilege. So I'd like to, um, so yes, as um, Morali has said, I am responsible for the Future Climate for Africa research program, um, which has been running for the last um, six years. Um, and I'd like to share some reflections with you today from the Fractal project under Future Climate for Africa. Um, which is um, looking at the future resilience of African cities and lands. And I think that they've made some really great strides and um, through their sustained program of engagement and co-development in nine cities across Southern Africa. Um, and so, you know, building on everything that the previous speakers have said, you know, cities are extremely complex spaces and climate change adds another layer of complexity to that as it manifests at multiple levels and across cross-cutting the risks in the city. So how has Fractal done things differently to try and tackle this? Well, I'm going to just give you a very quick, quick overview of six different ways it's done that. So firstly, it's done this by challenging this framing that it's an information or communication deficit, the idea that it's the lack of scientific information that uh, is causing our problems with decision making. And instead, it's focused on connecting city actors to existing science. Um, through in-depth and transdisciplinary research. So secondly, it has embedded researchers in city councils um, and through regular in-city learning labs throughout the six years of the programme to support that social learning and um, involving all the partners and city actors. Thirdly, there's been a very strong focus on understanding the governance of Southern African cities and looking for opportunities to support climate related decision making. And um, fourthly, in really involving city actors in interrogating how climate change information itself is constructed um, and decisions that are made on underlying assumptions in the climate science um, and climate modelling itself, trading uncertainty, certainty against the risk of error and challenges to communication. And building on that, the fifth way is um, about using co-produced climate risk narratives um, or stories of the future for different city regions to support those dialogues around climate change and particularly engagement with uncertainty. And then finally, that's been brought together through a, a climate information distillation framework, which has supported that transparent, collaborative climate information construction. Now, um, if we want to support the next generation of youth in this, to grapple with the you know, complex problems such as climate resilience and adaptation in cities. Um, we need to support the learning that's going on in universities within a holistic and integrated mm -hmm. paradigm. Um, and transdisciplinary co-production is, is of course core to that paradigm. And that, that, that requires, I think the reflection from the program is that that and this project is that that requires new theories, new methods, new skills, new ways of learning to support outcomes and um, beyond just the scientific excellence and that this transdisciplinary co-production um, in some cases blurs that boundary between science and society. Now that requires um, our, our um, students and youth to develop competencies that might be otherwise um, not so um, traditional. So in competencies including um, social relevance and engagement, how to build trust, manage relationships, develop effective communication skills with diverse stakeholders, emotional and psychological competencies, self-awareness, self-discipline, time management, um, and ongoing reflexive competencies. And those require new support systems. So the early career researchers and um, youth in uh, um, all, all need support to develop these competencies and then of course to be able to share their experiences and to learn from others and one way that we've done that through future climate for africa is through a an early career research network um, and through strong mentoring relationships and um, so we also um need support from experienced researchers you know to be brave and be, to try new things and support from funders and institutions to allow them to do that so we need to put in place the networks and systems to enable this integrated holistic approach to tackle these complex problems. I think one overriding reflection from Fractal as a whole is a genuine acknowledgement um, embedded in everything I've previously said of, of the value of diverse and perspectives and expertise. You know, in these complex urban settings and others, um, no one holds the full perspective. 
you know, all the data in the world can't tell me as a climate scientist sitting here in London what it's like to live with flooding in an informal settlement on the outskirts of Lusaka. So we need a genuinely inclusive process to fully understand everyone's perspectives on the challenges and co-develop those solutions. Now, the UK presidency of the COP26 provides a major opportunity to increase action on adaptation and resilience. And that needs to be underpinned by knowledge and by understanding what works and what doesn't in different contexts and for and with different communities. So we're keen to use this opportunity of the COP26 um, to increase support for the kind of action orientated user centered research that we've been discussing today and the other speakers have highlighted and to work with the research and action communities to establish an adaptation research alliance. Um, to that end for launch at COP26. So if you're interested in that, please do get in touch with me and thanks very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rosalind. We have a, um, time is never our friend when we're having fun conversations, is it? Uh, there were lots of interesting themes, uh, lots of rich themes. Uh, and what, what was common here was that, you know, this is complex, uh, there are deep divides here, uh, that it's important to do, that networks are important. And uh, so those were themes that seemed to characterize uh, the scope of things. And I like, Sheila, your comment around this uh, slums, communities, cities, and universities. If I can add uh, a couple of C words to that uh, and have us think about colleges and universities, communities, cities, corporates, thinking about private sector funding, and countries as well, you need let all these layers to, to collaborate. So if I can just have each of the speakers in the panel reflect on and, and comment to this one theme that I'll identify, then we can switch to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the group uh, uh, breakout sessions. And I'll start with Ambassador Fuller, uh, if she's still here, just a quick comment. What should be different in any one of these actors what should be different than what has characterized the past? Something's got to give if we've got to make transformative progress. So uh, Ambassador Fuller, if you can comment on what should country governments do differently? And then I'll, I'll jump to Lauren, uh, and then we'll go to Sheila, Rohia, and, uh, and to Rosalind. Just a very quick reflection on what needs to be different as we look into the future. Uh, thank you, Dr. Morali. Uh, you, you just caught me because I unfortunately do have to go to my other meeting. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to just uh, perhaps, you know, reflecting on the Canadian experience. Uh, I think uh, that um, while so much action and important action is taking place at the, the community level, I think we're seeing the, seeing the need to uh, create create stronger networks between different levels of government and a stronger alignment of our, uh, our of our efforts, including uh, uh, investments. You know how we fund uh, uh, um, action from the federal level to other levels. So I, I would say that um, greater uh, um, greater alignment, and and I think we're seeing that the most effective way to do that is really. To take that 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 risk-based focus, while very much keeping in mind the interrelationships among risks and the need to to uh, uh, have a you know an all risk perspective. So, thanks. Thank you, Ambassador Full. I know you have to go, but thanks for joining us, and we'll be in touch uh, with your office uh, going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Morelli. Bye, all. Thank you, Lauren. Your thoughts one theme that needs to be different? Thanks, really. For, for me, it has to be speed and leaning into discomfort. <laughs> I, I think what we've seen with COVID-19 is that it's broken down barriers and created um, urgent alliances. And we really can't afford to lose that. We're in the same situation with a number of global shocks and stresses. And so we've got to lean into that discomfort, have those conversations like Sheila was talking about earlier, about informality, about having basic care for urban dwellers. There's a really important reason we use that word and not citizens. So many of the people in our cities are recent migrants or they're undocumented. 
and we need to make sure we are taking care of people at the same time we are solving for the challenges that are making their lives so difficult in the first place, whether those be climate challenges, equity challenges, uh, race relations challenges. These are very real things that people are dealing with. Um, and we have to have open conversations across these shocks and these stresses. Thank you, Lauren. Sheila, how about you? You're muted, Sheila. For me, the most important thing is that speed in the face of really long-term wicked problems does not produce sustainable solutions. In fact, it has to be replaced with serious mining of unique knowledge that each constituency brings because that will produce the kind of disruptive change that we are looking for. Because there are too many things which we are comfortable doing, which have become conventional ways to adapt to crisis change that have to be changed. And so I think uh, the communities are the weakest, uh, least acknowledged groups. And you will find they come with a plethora of skills and capabilities that other people have to learn to recognize, acknowledge, uh, and in return, Communities have to build the confidence to dialogue and negotiate and sit on this high table to, dissolve, to resolve problems. Once that is done, we will get speed. But till then, we're going to go back to square one all the time. So for me, it's unique, qualitative contributions that each of these stakeholders, global, local, everybody has to bring. Thank you, Sheila. Rohia? I think, uh, Dr. Mor Morali. Um, no, so for me, I think what it, what needs to be really what really needs to change is that is the local ownership of data and, and and knowledge. So that doesn't mean that it doesn't involve a lot of international partner, all sorts of regional partners, citywide institutions. Uh, but I have often seen in my career that coming into a city, working with, uh, you know, local constituencies, that there is such a lack of kind of continuity, a lack, and a lack of continuity of kind of data resources and knowledge production. So, and you can only do that if you create this kind of long-term steady approach to resolving kind of the, the key issues at stake. And, um, um, and therefore, once more, that, that adaptation agenda um, that 10-year adaptation agenda, working with cities to resolve that is very, is, uh, is, 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 uh, is very important. Thank you, Rohia. Rosalind, how about you? Thanks so much. Um, you know, I think for me, it's really building on, on everyone else has said, but I, I think very much about the empowerment of that real shared ownership of the process of that collaborative research, of unpicking the problem, of identifying solutions, then what are the burning issues? How does climate change impact on those and compound them? And the shared ownership of the knowledge that's that produced from that and, and therefore the way that it is taken up and applied to the problems that so many people are tackling. Thanks. Fantastic. Uh, Smitha, over to you. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, apologies. Um, thank you to all the panelists for the excellent comments and also reactions and posing uh, to each other's comments and uh, uh, hopefully posing uh, and uh, opening the conversation for uh, additional collaborations uh, in the future. So now uh, we, what we would like to do is uh, break out into smaller groups. I know we have about uh, 24 participants. Uh, so we'll break out into uh, four groups. And uh, so about six participants each. Um, and each one of the uh, panelists will lead a conversation on two questions, uh, which have come up in this discussion. Um, and uh, the questions have already been shared with the panelists. Uh, so we will have a 
little more limited time than we shared here, but we will roughly have maybe around 20 minutes for this breakout session, and then we'll reconvene to share report back uh, in a larger group on what we heard on the two key questions for each group. Uh, over to Anna, who will support the breakout groups. Yes, Smita. Oh. I was going to say you can go to slide 16, but I will start the breakout groups now and you will see a button to click join group. So please do so once you're assigned to the group. So I will start that now. So we have, um, um, ah, people are coming in. Yeah, if you have the chance, share your video. It would be nice to see who's on the other side. We have 20 minutes for, for, for a discussion. Um, well, you know me, I was uh, being introduced and I've been talking, but it would be nice to have a quick round. Who, who, who's here at the table, at, the, at our virtual table? Agla, maybe you kick off. Um, yes, hi, I'm a volunteer for the CBA. So I'm just here for technical and Zoom support. If you have any um, questions or problems, please let me know. Hi, Mark, I see Mark Castillo. Yes, hello, I'm Mark. I'm actually a student in university, finishing my fourth year in civil engineering in Toronto, Canada. Thanks, thanks for joining. Sejal or Sejal. Yeah, hi. Hi, uh, uh, I'm uh, Sejal Patel, uh, and I'm not related to Sheila Patel, but I'm highly inspired uh, by her work, and we work very closely. Right. I'm a professor in faculty of planning in SEPT University, and I chair the housing program at SEPT. Thank you. Happy to and be here today. Georgina. Hi, um, I'm, I'm Georgina. I'm actually working with uh, the IIT um, in the digital teams and here to do some social media coverage. All right. I'll be mostly listening. That's OK. Thank you. Okay. OK, thank you. So we have, a, so we have a, um, a 15 to 20 minutes to kind of elaborate on this kind of other reasons why there is value in the co-production of knowledge between varied stakeholder groups including civil society actors, policy think tanks, university, city governments and donors, in order to support inclusive climate adaptation. Um, so I think it would be great if we use this, this, this time to really come up with a kind of a good kind of top three uh, uh, reasons. So um, maybe I can start to collect some ideas, um, kicking off uh, uh, maybe with, uh, with Mark, if you are comfortable, if not, we give the floor to Professor Sejal. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll be happy here maybe. Yeah. Mark, would you like to? I have some thoughts. Okay, have... good. Yeah. Okay, then, 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 then this is all, this is all, all about the, the, the new leaders, Mark. So uh, let's, uh, let's uh, kick yeah, it yeah, off. Because yeah. I'm in university and I'm going through the curriculum and going for the few years I'm in it. There's not a lot of involvement, surprisingly enough. There's always a lot of advocacy groups in mm -hmm. my university regarding like SDGs, but to like get really involved in like the nitty gritty, be involved with organizations, it's very local and not enough international settings that I found. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of value in having students, especially where I'm from, to have that international experience because for myself that I, I present, I went to like little stints in Africa doing research participatory research as an internship and working with other like higher education programs. And I found that a lot of students just don't realize the opportunities that is out there. And but, I, can you, but can you say something then on the uh, high, uh, Dr. Merlin? Um, can you say something if you say that, let's say that international exposure, can you also say something about how you, in your experience working locally, how you see that kind of opportunity to leverage that international experience and the kind of in the local context? For the lo leveraging the local context into the international experience? Yeah, you were, you were saying so that there's, there, there, there should be much more of this kind of exposure to the kind of to the international actors, international uh, um, uh, partners. Um, but can you 
clarified it a little bit in the context of your example, working in your, uh, on your own research in, in Africa, you mentioned. I, I just want to say I, why I mentioned that is because a lot of students just like, I feel like a lot of organizations that want to get the youth involved, I don't see them a lot in my university or is it's not like front and center in my university. I really want to hopefully soon more organizations and universities have real direct contact and more collaboration because I feel I see less of that. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, because for myself, it's very busy as a student and reach, finding ways to reach to the youth is mm -hmm. really challenging. Thanks, thanks. Um, Seja. Uh, yes, thank you, Roger. Um, I believe, and I would take uh, this forward from where Sheila, uh, you know, uh, what she mentioned that uh, uh, India, and I, I, I bring in, bring forth my experience as an academician and practitioner and researcher in the Indian context and working with the local communities and government in the Indian context, where I see the need for uh, the collaboration and networks is mainly in, uh, is, is in uh, uh, having the community, the urban poor community and the youth of the community, bringing them at the center and making them development agents. Actually, they are the development agents in a lot of cities. And they are the ones who, I think through the seminal work of SDI, Spark and NSDF and a lot of other NGOs, they are the ones who are, uh, especially in the informal settlements, self-enumerating and self-mapping. And through this process of self-enumeration and self-mapping, they are generating knowledge about themselves. Now, the problem is that in the process of this knowledge or, or co production of the knowledge, uh, some handholding is required in terms of cleaning of the data and also setting basic protocol in analyzing the data, which gives them a narrative about their own selves and about their access to basic services like water, sanitation, uh, health, education, and uh, 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 you know, decent shelter. Uh, so this is where quite often academicians work with the NGOs in building the capacities of the development agents within the poor community. And they, through this process, generate knowledge about themselves. Now, this becomes a very powerful tool for the <laughs> youth, for the youth, and also for the community to negotiate with the state in actually influencing decision and policies in their favor. And if they are, they are the producers of this knowledge, which is what we call the horizontal knowledge which is created through these networks of uh, NGOs and the community with the support of academia, this knowledge then becomes a tool through which the development agents and the youth make the local government or the state government come on the negotiating table. And to a large extent, the work of Sheila and Spark and NSDF and a lot of few other NGOs like Seva and MHT as well in Ahmedabad and other cities, through this work, they collaborate with the local government and influence decision uh, and policies in their favor. So I think with all of these networks, the community and especially the youth of the community becomes the focus and they are the development agents and the others then network around them to build their capacities in producing the knowledge. This is one aspect. The second aspect now is where the state needs to step in. Very often, beautiful and very rigorous data has been produced by the community, but the state does not ratify the data. Because, you know, what uh, the famous uh, seeing the state, I think it is really about how does the state see the people? So sorry, uh, uh, Sajad, when, 
sorry, when you talk about the state, you mean the national government or the state, like in the I Indian mean state? The state as in the local or the state government or the yeah, national yeah. government. The ah, state. Okay, good. All right, good. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, sorry, sorry, continue, continue. So yeah. the so uh, the so uh, what does the state now have to do? I think, uh, and I, we have we have uh, witnessed uh, quite a, uh, quite a few instances where such rich data, which is produced by the by the grassroots organizations or the community themselves, are not accepted or ratified by the state. And I'll give you an example of uh, again the slum mapping of the entire city all the settlements and the enumeration which has been done by uh, you know various organizations mainly the alliance of spark and nsdf but a few other organizations also with their help the way the communities have generated the data the state does not recognize the data so i think the second important aspect is for the state to recognize the alternatively produced data and accept that in the future policy making as well uh, because this is a here the uh, the beneficiary becomes the the producer of the data and so there isn't man, any manipulation in the data and this should be accepted uh, by the state which is not happening and i think this is one of the key innovation and the key uh, focus which is required for the state to give the protocol that if the data if there are data has to be accepted, what is the kind of protocol for the data? In what format is it to be generated? What level of accuracy do they expect? And uh, so the entire protocol for it to be accepted. But once that protocol is met by the community, irrespective of the politics around the data, that should be ratified. If we have that, then it becomes a first step of collaboration and partnership. And all of this, I feel, can be done keeping the youth, the aspirational youth of the urban poor community at the center and being ably supported and, uh, uh, you know, uh, by, the, by the academia. I have one more point as well, but I, I think I've taken enough time. So maybe if others would like to add, uh, I can then come back later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, John. Um, um, now this is very very clearly articulated. Um, I mean, I was wondering if you look if you look at the partners. Maybe one question before I move to Dr. Morali um, is is bef if you look if you talk about the ratifying the data, do you think that apart from the community, um, an organized community group um what are other actors that can help to advance this kind of that, that, that ratified um uh, data at the state side is it the state plus international actors the civil society i mean what what type of what type of um arrangement is needed to kind of get this kind of id come to uh, to uh, get to work I think one, this is where academia and uh, the policy think tanks, which mm -hmm. work or support the government in uh, formulating policy and creating evidences for policies is yeah. where, uh, you know, uh, they uh, can play a big role in, uh, in, in setting this protocol for the state mm -hmm. that uh, how would such horizontally generated data be accepted and uh, what should be the protocol for it. Thanks. The third aspect, which is also related to mm -hmm. uh, using this data for uh, policy decision and how is it to be used also. But I can, as I mentioned, Roger, I can come back to that yeah. uh, later if the other participants have any. I see new participants. Uh, I see Dr. Morali. I see Mr. or Mrs. Anwar. I'm, I'm just listening in. Uh, All Dr. right. Thank you. should just go with Mir. I'm just yeah. going to. Hi, Mir. this is Mir Anwar Hussain. Hi. Hello. Hi. So please introduce yourself and maybe you already have some ideas around the discussion prompt. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm hearing, uh, I'm connecting just uh, right now. Uh, uh -huh. One thing I want to share that uh, uh, youth leadership will start from college and school and university. So uh, our government or uh, local NGOs should uh, uh, 
i mean encouraging uh, program and se seminar uh, to uh, join the youth okay and uh, engagement of youth uh, youth in uh, various drr community like uh, 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 disaster risk reduction management committee from where they can uh, uh, got the idea about uh, climate change and climate adaptation uh, like this okay Sorry, but uh, uh, Mir, can you introduce? I just I just missed uh, where you're uh, from. And, uh, I'm I, I'm a monitoring and evaluation officer, DRCC from India, a national okay. NGO. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mark, Dr. Sejal, Mark, you have some further thoughts around this, uh, uh, around the key reasons or the three reasons uh, around co-production. Mark, you're muted. Yes. So yeah. I just wanted to emphasize that when I will, in going through my studies, there's just just not enough like I for to connect us, the youth, to these kind of organizations and to the different like adaption and climate changes. We're just not aware. We're simply just like we're just not aware of it. So like the different organizations or different actors involved in my experience because since i'm in my lectures and such we just we i had to dig a lot to find information about other ngos international organizations and i feel like if my classmates had more information they'll be more willing to engage and i think it's super important too mm -hmm. Thanks, baby. Before I get back to uh, Dr. Sejal, a couple of thoughts from my side related to the, I, we, we discussed around the um, adaptation summit and about the, the different, what, what is meant, what is called the, the action tracks under the Global Commission on the Adaptation. So I'm leading the city's action track where we bring networks, um, international networks, um, institutions, um, think tanks uh, uh, together really looking and and what kind of surprised me most still after being for quite a bit in in the development space is that there's a lot of overlapping geographies and at even overlapping communities that we are engaging in as international actors think tanks in collaboration directly with the communities or through kind of local proxies and you see a huge amount of information and data is kind of scattered among these partners and, and, and not very well shared. Uh, and and, and there, there, I think um, there is some sort of a tipping point now between the actors getting a bit tired of, um, I think Lauren mentioned to accelerate. Well, one thing is to accelerate is to kind of share some of these knowledge products and data sets among these partners in a kind of in the context of collaboration and we're trying to set up what it actually means in you know in operational terms to actually do that that is one thing that is around sharing data analytics and knowledge um, when working in the kind of the same uh, geography um, because if you identify the complementary skill sets of each of the organization you don't need necessarily have to be afraid about things that are going to be shared or not being kind of owned and because there's always an ownership question in every kind of relationship um, around the production of data and knowledge the other thing is that um, what we've seen is that um, each of these organization local um, um, and international have different entry points to 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 the authorities that you can leverage so if you can bring together somehow the opportunity of, of making use of each of these entry points um, and especially because political terms are shifting so quickly that you really need every entry point that is available to quickly kind of make things move. Um, so that's another point of view that I just wanted to share with you that came up in the, in the discussions and the negotiations uh, around um, collaboration under the Cities Action Track. Dr. Sejal, please. Yeah, thank you, Roger. I think I, 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 that's a very important point you've raised, and I couldn't agree more that there is a data fatigue. I mean, uh, there is just so much of data, and uh, 
it's just been churned and rechurned. So I could not agree more that if there is some system or mechanism through which it is standardized and it is disseminated and it is available or made available to everybody in the same sort of format, I think that is a very important step and that needs to be accelerated besides, of course, the other issues that you have also mentioned. Uh, I uh, wanted to share one experience of a local um, partnership which actually happened incidentally but has now become a good example of a partnership uh, uh, which culminated in a local heat action plan in in the city of Ahmedabad. Uh, so the urban poor communities who are who live in the informal settlements uh, they in, uh, in, in the city, uh, it, uh, the, the city of Ahmedabad, for instance, is in a agroclimatic zone, which is very uh, hot and arid, and it has extremely harsh summers. And when majority of the uh, families who are living in informal settlements with thin roof, they get very, very, uh, you know, hot summers in the dwelling units. And in at least three months, a lot of them used to get sunstroke or heat stroke and would not be able to report or earn the, earn the livelihood. Uh, a lot of the family members, the kids would not be able to go to school uh, and the uh, male and the female members of the house, the heads of the house would not, uh, would have to miss out on earning the livelihoods. And because of this, they uh, quite often missed on paying their EMIs to the local microfinance institution mm -hmm. when this default happened the uh, the the ngo or the microfinance institution which is actually an ngo as well working in the shelter issues they actually through their uh, grassroots level leaders who were again the youth tried to get reasons or, or the the main factors because of which this default was happening and they realized this because of the sunstroke and so that triggered the idea of how can we, with minimal cost, bring in a better uh, sort of uh, adaptation or thermal comfort through a minimal incremental cost at the local level. And this is where, uh, I think we have just two minutes as I understand. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think this is where uh, the NGO got in touch with the academicians and the academicians, uh, 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 the university gave some idea about how their basic use or houses can be changed and tweaked. Uh, they launched a new program called Cool Roof Program for the urban poor communities. And what are the basic uh, sort of uh, requirements or changes to be done? retrofitting to be done at the shelter level to bring about thermal comfort and that has brought about a major shift now this is a big uh, this ended up becoming a partnership between the community again uh, driven by the youth leaders uh, the ngo and the microfinance institution the academia and all of them together approached the local government to initiate a heat action plan and a cool roof plan under which they also gave a uh, subsidy to the urban poor community to retrofit their houses. Mm. But this, yeah. is, this, is, this is an example of what you say, uh, uh, having uh, um, this collaboration becoming kind of a real kind of change agent. I mean, Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I gave one example of knowledge produced to a production, but this is an example of an actual intervention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just keeping the youth as the, at the center. Mm. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Last remarks from uh, anyone here in the meeting because we need to jump off to the to the to the to the reporting. No. So thank you. I'm going to quickly kind of put some of these notes uh, together. Um, 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 thanks a lot for for your contribution and the discussion. And uh, see you at the, the plenary in a couple of seconds. Thank you. See you. See you. Yeah. So we leave the room and it will direct will be directed to the main room now right yes i i i think so any moment i'm not sure where
Um, yes, you should have a selection to leave the breakout room. If you don't, I can ask Anna to uh, close the breakout room. Yep. Are we all back to the main room? Yes, we should all be back now. Fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody. So as we get uh, as we get back, we want to hear from you. We want to partner with all of you. Uh, and uh, based on the conversation that uh, that I've heard, there's obviously a lot of uh, enthusiasm. So there's a link that's included here for the Google Doc. You can click on that uh, and uh, share examples of initiatives that have supported this kind of work that we've been discussing. That'd be great. Anna, would you put that Google Doc in the chat as well so people have that and can click on that? So we really want to hear from you and we want to partner with you. So uh, let's let's kick it off. We have four different uh, people, two, two uh, groups per, uh, per question, I think, and then we combined uh, some groups. So let's start with, uh, with Rohia. Uh, if you want to just update on your, uh, on the group that you uh, moderated very quickly, but, I know that we're running out of time, so just a yes. quick, it would be great. Yes, a quick feedback. It was a very interesting uh, discussion, uh, of course, uh, and, uh, and too short, but uh, a couple of things mentioned. Uh, what is the value on the co-production? Uh, three reasons why there's value in this co-production. First of all, if communities become potential um, um, actors of change, uh, development agents, uh, based on their own enumerations on their own kind of data um, uh, capacities. The question is, how can we better kind of um, organize that what they enumerated in a way that we can use it either to negotiate or to bring forward? So if there's a relation between opportunities to use youth um, and communities as a development agent based on their self enumerated data, uh, but in the combination of actors, you can come to protocols that are useful for negotiation. So that is, I think, one point made. The second point, the value of that collaboration is in how to work with local, state, and national actors to actually ratify that data to take actually into consideration for policy change and action. So that is a complex political process in which you need universities, uh, um, uh, um, um, and in which policy think tanks, international actors can also have a role, depending, of course, on the kind of the political setting. But bringing these actors together in really moving that data forward in, 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 a, in, a, in a ratified and a useful um, 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 data input to policy making. We also talked about how um, you can how the the collaboration is necessary to bring the kind of the scattered data and knowledge pieces together between the actors there is already a lot of data there is already a lot of knowledge also between the international uh, community um, ngos so how do you bring that together in order to accelerate action and um, not only the data pieces but also the political entry points um, you know, political life is short, so you need to move fast. So you need all the leverage that you that you have. Um, last point is made. Um, um, if you are a student, the future youth leader, who is going to help you to navigate through that complexity of international actors, NGOs that are actually active on the ground? I leave it with this. Many more to tell, but uh, for now, uh, this is it. So thank you, Rohir. Sheila, how about you? Sheila, I thought Smita was going to do that. Okay, I'll okay. do it. I'll Please do, it. do that. Yeah, thank you, Sheila. So I'm we so busy talking, so I didn't <laughs> take notes. That's good. So we did have a great uh, discussion. A couple of key points I would like to highlight. One, there was a question raised on so many different initiatives on knowledge development that are going on all over the world. Uh, but there perhaps is a need for uh, some kind of common platform which could share learnings that these initiatives have had and the reflections they have, or even knowledge products that they have developed on a common platform for climate adaptation. That was one question that was raised. The second question uh, that was raised was, maybe there's a role for uh, the global alliances uh, 
to do some kind of guideline setting work, whereas a lot of the actual work with communities could be done by more locally based knowledge hubs. So what are those locally based knowledge hubs and how can we sustain them uh, over for long term partnerships was a key question uh, raised. Then one other key question that was raised is in all this work, how do we ensure that the smaller projects that are led by civil society organizations, smaller community based organizations are also included and not excluded. Uh, so perhaps there was a discussion on maybe there's a mechanism for these local knowledge hubs to aggregate projects uh, from multiple communities, but smaller scale projects and jointly apply for funding from some of the uh, global, uh, national philanthropy and other uh, kind of funders. So there could be some joint fundraising to support small uh, initiatives as well. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Smita. Rosalind? Is Rosalind still here with us or has she had to duck out? No, sorry, I am still here and um, we just had such rich discussion. I'm just struggling to summarize it. And so, um, I, you know, one, one point that we raised was around that co-production and the value of co-production is that it allows us to redress the, the sort of power balance of who holds the knowledge and who is the expert. You might think that you might go into a project like this thinking that the knowledge is um, held by the, the researchers and the scientists and that they're the experts um, and that they're taking that to the community. But co-production provides us with an opportunity to completely invert that and to really redress that balance because actually a lot of the knowledge is held in the community and the researchers are there to can help to, to gather that and extract it if we get the right um, if we facilitate that in the right way and we get the right conditions in place to do that and the second thing then follows on from that which is that this process is is the value of the process very much in empowering communities um, and marginalized groups um, and the value of their knowledge um, and uh, and then from that building solutions to the challenges so breaking down the barriers building common ground being humble and, and building trust in order to really share um, to bridge that gap between um, communities and the researchers. Um, and then finally, we had a discussion around um, how the, the value of engaging youth in technology transfer and that that can create local ownership and um, capacity strengthening and knowledge independence in, in local um, places. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so with, with, with that, we've, we've heard from the groups uh you know um it's it's true that time never is our friend uh, and i've said this once before and i've also said repeatedly to my students at least that no dream is pursued alone uh and so we look forward to hearing from you uh, you have a couple of email addresses here more than staying in touch i think we welcome an opportunity to to work together with a range of institutions from a range of different backgrounds. And it's only through this collaborative work that we can start making headway. So please send either Smitha an email or send me an email. You see the email addresses here. Continue to join the conversation. We look forward to hearing from you and uh, seeing that we're over time. I just wanna thank you all for joining this important conversation. Uh, there are so many things they could have been possibly doing at this time of the day but to join this conversation and give us your thoughts, your wisdom uh, is, is a big act of generosity. So thank you so much to everybody. Uh, and uh, I guess with that, we'll, uh, we'll say thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.